find in your Bibles James chapter 5 this morning, and we are almost through preaching through the book of James. Uh, we've been at it for quite some time, and you know the Lord knows exactly what He's doing. The Lord knows exactly uh, when we need something, and when it needs to be said, when it needs to be preached, and uh, that goes the same way with the preacher. Um, you know, even with the, with the snowstorm that we had, the ice storm, whatever you want to call it, the winter storm, uh, we, we kept, took one week off. And uh, so this Sunday, before I go to have this procedure and recovery, I'll be preaching about patience as we go through the book of James. And uh, without question, if nobody else needs that, which I have a hard time believing that I'm the only one that needs to hear a message preached about patience, but if nobody else needs it, God got it with me, okay, because I don't have much of it, and uh, we need to have patience. But one thing, uh, as, as we talk about this subject today, the title of the message is Stand Fast and Hold On. You ever been that place in your life where all you can do was just kind of stand fast, you just stand your ground and you hold on. I read something this week, uh, if all you can do is hold on to something, just a thread, make sure it is the hem of the Lord's garment. Amen. And so what, what we understand this morning and what James has taken us through in this book is that we all have troubles and we all have trials and we all have persecutions and we all go through stuff in life, don't we? Amen. Uh, whether that may be this pandemic that we've gone through or just the stuff of life. You know, the doctor called and said, you got high cholesterol. you got to go through that. There's things that we go through in our life. And there are trials. And there, if we are following after Christ, we will have persecutions in this life. Paul said this, all who live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And in this text, James teaches us how to combat our problems, our hardships, our persecutions. How do we do that? How do we combat uh, people that persecute us because we're Christian? How do we combat the problems and just the stuff that we have to deal with in life? Uh, some people, maybe our natural reaction is this. I'll retaliate against them. I will get even with them. I'll get ahead of them. Uh, and that's how I'll respond to the issues and the problems and the hardships of my life. But James says that's not how the Christian responds to those things in life. We respond with patience. We respond enduring, with, with patient endurance. Now here's the truth of the matter. None of us are good at waiting, are we? Amen. None of us are good at waiting. And we don't like to wait. We like to, we, we just don't enjoy waiting. Uh, we want to get on with it. We want it now. We live in an uh, in instant society today. We want answers instantly, so we turn to Google. We want a cup of coffee, and they even make that instant these days. Uh, I don't understand that yet, but, uh, but anyway, maybe I'll grow. But you know, whether it's the grocery store, or the bank, or the doctor's office, or the restaurant, or even the DMV. I mean, that may, be, that may be the pinnacle of waiting, but we don't like it. We're not good at it. None of us have it, and, and it comes naturally to us. And so we all stand in need of more patience. We can't live a godly life without patience. Now, I'll say this, and I'll move on to my first point. Paul had much to say about the area of patience. To the Corinthians, Paul said that patience was a characteristic of love. To the Galatians, he said that it was a trait of the fruit of the Spirit. To the Ephesians, he said a life worthy of God's calling involves patience. To the Colossians, he said they were to clothe themselves in patience. So remember who James is writing to. He's writing to people who were experiencing intense persecution. They were scattered abroad. They were persecuted by the wicked because they were children of God. And so he writes to them about patience. And in last week's text, we talked about how the rich men were taking advantage of the child of God or the poor man. And so notice, first of all, in this text, notice in verse 7, he tells us to live with patient endurance. Live with patient endurance. And look at the command that he gives to us in verse 7. He says, be patient, therefore, brethren. 
Be patient, therefore, brethren. And, and the command, you see the word therefore, uh, it kind of takes us back to what he has previously stated. And what has he previously stated? That they were being oppressed and they were being abused because they were Christians. How were they to respond to that type of treatment? How were they to respond to the issues that they were going through in life? And we're all going through stuff, aren't we? You've got your stuff going on. I've got my stuff going on. And so how do we respond to the stuff of life? That's, the, that's what we're going to answer today. And the first thing he says, live with patient endurance. Notice he's talking to ch children of God here in verse 5. He says, brethren. And he uses that, that phrase, brethren, five times in this fifth chapter. But in problems, when we're going through stuff in our life, we tend to think that those things are going to last forever. You going to get a witness? Man, man, it's going to last forever. It'll never get better. We'll, we'll never get past it. The sun will never shine again. And the things will never be uh, good in my life again. Things will never be normal again. But listen, here's the truth of the matter. I want to encourage you today as you're going through your stuff, they will not last forever. Amen. You know what James says? Jesus is coming. Amen. Just hang on. Stand fast. Hold on. Jesus Christ is coming Amen. again. And he tells us here that listen, I want to be like, like some of the Old Testament patriarchs looking for a city whose builder and maker is God. This world is not my home. I'm Amen. just passing through. Amen. Listen, I've got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. And one of these days, King Jesus is going to come again. Just And we're going to see Him in the flesh. Amen. We're going to see Him with our eyes. Your problems will not last forever. Jesus is coming. Amen. So He says, be patient. Be patient. And the word patient there means to suffer long. It means to go through it. There's some things we have to go through. There's some suffering that we have to endure. I have preached my microphone on. <laughs> We've got to go through it. We've got to endure it. We've, listen, not retaliate, but to endure and have patience. And that's so hard because that's just not natural. We want to... We want to barge in there and do something. We, we, want to, uh, we want to take care of business. But what we need to understand is this. There's always been opposition to Christianity. Always. And that's nothing new. And so James is saying, bear it bravely. Uh, bear it bravely uh, without complaint, without resentment. There's always been hardships and injustices. But how do we respond? How do we respond to an anti-Jesus culture? How do we respond to a world that seems to be more and more out of tune with God, with His Word, with His people? Well, I think a good way to respond is the way Jesus responded. 1 Peter, and you're almost there if you've got your Bible open. 1 Peter chapter 2. Now, this is not going to be right upstairs because I messed up in my outline. But 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 21 and verse 22 well, notice what Peter says. For even hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that ye should follow in his steps. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. And so notice Christ there suffered. Uh, he, he suffered. He went through with patience. He endured. Now I want you to notice the cause of why he says be patient. Notice there, he says, be patient, therefore, be patient because, brethren, the Lord is coming. Unto the coming of the Lord. Why be patient? Why endure? Because the Lord is coming. And the coming of the Lord, that phrase there, it emphasizes the nearness of the Lord's coming. It emphasizes how close the Lord is and the certainty of His coming. And the language used here is that of a royal visit. You know, when royalty was coming, the royalty was coming and coming soon. Well, notice what James is saying, that royalty is on his way. The King of kings and the Lord of lords, he's coming. Amen. And he says, be patient, therefore, unto the coming of the Lord. 
Uh, don't take matters into your own hand. How many of you like that? Uh, don't take matters into your own hand. Why? Because the king is coming. The king is still on his throne. Uh, don't don't uh, don't hide away and uh, and, and just and just. <coughs> Get in a hole somewhere because the king is coming. Don't get angry at stuff of life because the king is coming. Don't get ahead or get even with someone because the king is coming. And we must wait for the king to act because one day he will right all wrongs. That's Amen. our great hope that Jesus is coming. He's coming to, to, uh, to, to bring wrath on this earth, but he's also coming to take us out of this mess. To take us whole, to be with Him. And so we must face our problems in light of this hope that the King is coming. Romans chapter 8 and verse 18, Paul says uh, in, in that book, in that verse, uh, he says, For I reckon, boy, I love that. I, I think that's a good East Texas word, don't you? <laughs> he says, For I reckon. For I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy all this stuff that we're going through, all this stuff that we're dealing with, even persecutions, notice what he says, are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. The King is coming. Amen. He also said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17, Paul talks about this again there. And he says, for our light affliction. And I always thought that was a little humorous because Paul was beaten. He was stoned. He was left for dead. He was shipwrecked. He went through some stuff for the cause of Christ. But he says, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, it's only temporary. It's passing away. But notice what he says, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. The King is coming. And when Jesus comes, all the pain of this life is going to vanish away. Amen. And so he says, live with patient endurance. Keep your eyes focused. How many times do you really think about Jesus coming again? Yesterday, as you maybe did some chores around the house, you enjoyed your Saturday Whatever you found yourself doing, how many times yesterday did you think, you know, Jesus is coming? <coughs> we may not think about it as much as, as we should, if we can agree right there. Let's, let's move on. Secondly, notice this. Live in patient expectation. Live in patient expectation. And as James does, he provides the preacher with an illustration here. And he says in verse 7, James knows the difficulty of patience, and so he gives us this illustration. He says, Behold, the husbandman waiteth for the precious fruit of the earth, and hath long patience for it, until he received the early and the latter rain. And so notice the, the illustration here, the, the husbandman or the farmer. What does the farmer do? He tills the soil. He plants the seed. He's a sharecropper. That's who we're talking about here. A tiller of the soil, a farmer. And these husbandmen, their, they, uh, their crops were vital. They, they couldn't miss a crop or they couldn't survive. The next year was going to be really tough. They had to have every crop. It was Everything was on the line here. And so the husbandman, the farmer, think about what he does. He prepares the soil. He uh, fertilizes the ground. He sows the seed. He tends and he gets weeds out from around the plants. But listen, that's all he can do, isn't it? He has no control over how that seed grows. He has no control at that point when he has done all of those things. He has no control on the growth of that plant and he has no control on if it's going to rain or not. He has no control. Now we're talking about a time before there was any irrigation or anything like that. But listen, the only one who can send rain is Almighty God. Amen. And so the farmer would wait patiently. He would do all the work. He would lay the groundwork. He would plant the seed. He would take care of the weeds and get all of those things out. But he had to wait patiently for the Lord to, to, to bring the rain. So he waits patiently on God. Well, what does he do as he's waiting? 
He didn't go up there and lay up for months and months. He works, but he waits, and he works, and he waits, and he works, and he waits, and he's waiting on the rain. Notice the early and the latter rain. The early rain was in about October, and they relied on that rain because it softened the ground. And then the latter rain it was came along in spring, and that would bring the plant to full fruit, fruitfulness. And so he waited. That's the illustration here. Now notice the application in verse 8. He says, Be ye also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. As the farmer has to wait, notice what he's saying. As the farmer has to wait, we must live in expectation of the Lord's return. Are you living in light that Jesus could come again? Are you living in light that Jesus is coming and He is going to return? Listen, we should be as the farmer. We should be watching and we should be working and we should be waiting because Jesus is coming. We've got to be patient. Don't be agitated. Don't be uptight. Don't develop an inner sense. We've got to develop an inner sense of stability. Notice the word established in verse 8. That means to strengthen, to make firm the inner life, to make unmovable. And he's saying, take courage here. Establish your hearts. Someone said it like this. Put iron into your hearts. Put iron into your hearts. How? It can only be done by looking heavenward and living in light that Jesus is coming. Working in light that Jesus is coming. Uh, sharing Jesus and, and living how He would want us to live in light of His coming. Now we can have patience in the midst of our problems and our adversity and the stuff of this life, but we must anticipate the coming of the Savior. We must endure and patiently expect. And then look at an instruction in, in verse 9. And this almost seems to be out of place in verse 9, but notice He gives us a caution here. He says, grudge not one against another. I wonder why he says that there. Well, what's our natural response when we go through stuff in life? What's our natural response when we are persecuted for our stand in God's Word and our, our following after Christ? Our, our first response, maybe, is to complain. That's a normal response. To complain and to be impatient and to be irritable irritable to those who are closest to us. But he says here, grudge not. Don't murmur. Don't grumble. Don't complain. Don't sigh or groan as you're going through this stuff of life. Don't take troubles out on others. You know what our true character is revealed? It's not when everything's going right. Our true character is revealed in times of adversity. When things are falling apart around us, that's when our true character comes, uh, comes out. And notice what James is telling these believers. He's saying, come together in those times of adversity. Come together in times of persecution. Come together at the things of life. And not only draw closer to one another as believers, but draw closer to the Lord in those times in our lives. Let problems unite us, not divide us. That's what I'm trying to say. And then look at the condemnation in verse 9. He says, lest you be condemned. He says, don't grudge, don't murmur, don't complain, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Don't fall out with one another because the judge is at the door. We're not, we're not only going to be judged for our actions, but also for our words. And the door will soon open the door of judgment. And so we, we must patiently endure. We must patiently expect. And then I want you to notice thirdly, we must live by patient examples. Notice in this last point, we, we, we have some examples to live by. And James gives us two different examples. First of all, we should live... Uh, learning from the prophets. We should learn from past saints. Look at verse 10. He says, Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering affliction and of patience. You want to talk about somebody who went through some stuff for the, for the work of God? Read about Jeremiah. Read about how no one listened to his message. 
Read about how he was thrown in prison. Read about how everyone hated him and despised him. And there he is, still preaching the warning from God. Still preaching and faithfully doing what God wanted him to do. He's thrown in prison. His heart is breaking because he knows God is going to bring judgment. And nobody's listening to his warning. He says in verse 11, the whole we count them happy which endure. And so we need to learn from the prophets. They went through some hard suffering and they had patience. They had hard patience. Notice the word example in verse 10. It means the pattern, the copy, the imitation. He's saying imitate the prophets. They suffered not because they did wrong, but because they did what God wanted them to do. You know, sometimes we suffer because we, we just step out of the way, right? Maybe we get our nose in other people's business where it doesn't belong. And then we want to cry persecution card when, when the lid is slammed on our nose. <laughs> He's not saying that. He's saying they did no wrong. They served Christ and yet they had to suffer affliction. They suffered because they were doing what God wanted them to do. They were not exempt from ill treatment because they were Jeremiah or any of those guys. And neither are we. We won't be either. Jesus said they persecuted me. They'll persecute you. Later, James would not denounce his faith in Christ. And he would be thrown down, history tells us, from the pinnacle of the temple. But notice God blesses those who endure. Happy are they who endure. And not only should we learn from the prophets and live by those examples, but let's learn from the patriarch. And he goes on here uh, in verse 11, and he says, Ye have heard of the patience of Job. My mercy. We don't even want to think about that, do we? <laughs> Perhaps Job suffered more loss than any other human being on the face of the earth. And he says here in verse 11, You've heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. And we know about we know about the loss of Job. We know in, in one moment he lost all of his all of his possessions, all of his cattle, all of his servants, all of his workers. Everything was called in one day for Job. And then we know in a moment he was told his children were gone. They were all dead. He went through some stuff. But listen, he went through it with patience. And this is what James is telling us. Patience. This word patience in verse 11 is a little different than the other verses. It means endurance that does not give in under hardship. And I'm telling you, that's what we need. We need some endurance that does not give in under hardship. We need some steadfastness. And he endured the unimaginable, the unexplainable suffering in Job chapter 1 and verse 22. Notice what that verse says there. In all this, Job sinned not, nor charged God foolishly. In another scripture in the book of Job, Job said, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. In the scripture we opened up this service with, uh, he says, uh, he says, I know that my Redeemer liveth. Amen. And I'm going to stand before Him. And I'm going to see Him in, with my eyes at the, at the end, at the latter day. And I want you to understand, Job was not perfect. But Job was very patient as he went through the stuff that life threw at him. Notice, see the end of Job. Notice that in verse 11. You've heard the patience of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. How could he patiently endure all of that that he went through? He trusted the physician. Amen. He knew God had a reason. Though he may not understand it, he trusted Almighty God. Listen, you might be going through some hard stuff in your life today. Would you trust the Master? Let me give you this illustration. And again, it's very fitting. If a man came at me to attack me with a knife, and he wanted to, he wanted to take what he wanted to do me harm. 
He wanted to kill me. I would resist that man with all of my strength. And I'd be disappointed if he got me. <laughs> I'd say, man, I failed today. He got me. All right, but I want you to think about this. If a surgeon comes to us with a knife, and he's going to cut on us, what do we do? We get up on the table. Right? We get on the table. We welcome his work. We say, surgeon, just fix me. Cut me open. Cut me open wider. Bigger than the attacker would cut me open because, here's the reason, here's the difference. Because the surgeon, he has a purpose and we know that that is good and we know that it is necessary. That's how Job could endure all of the, those unthinkable things. He trusted the surgeon. The Lord had a purpose. There was an end. And notice what else he says about God. He says he's very pitiful. Meaning he's sympathetic. He's merciful. He's compassionate. And he is of tender mercy. He's merciful. He's compassionate. And I want you to understand that the same God that was compassionate to Job is the same God that we worship and serve today. Amen. He's there. He's full of tender mercy. He's full of compassion. And I hate to go through the stuff of this life without Almighty God. Amen. As we get ready, let's have a song of invitation this morning. May I encourage you this morning. Don't give up. Don't lose heart. Don't forsake Christ. These believers, they were, they were suffering greatly because they were Christians. That coming to us could be. Don't lose heart. Don't forsake Christ. <coughs> if we left God, where would we go? If we left the Word of God, what word are we going to turn to? What better place? If we leave God, where are we going to go? There is no better place. Let me say, Jesus is coming. Amen. And I want you to understand this. You can take all of life and you can compare it. Take all the life. Take the good, the bad, the ugly. And just put it all to one side. And then you think about eternity. You think about Jesus coming. You think about finally being home with Him and all that we have waiting on us that we can't even imagine. I tell you, that far outweighs what we're going through right now. The good, the bad, the ugly. Heaven's going to be better. Jesus is coming. And it's better when we compare it with eternity. It's going to be worth it all when we see Jesus Christ. And so let's cling to Christ. Let's hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. Let me ask you this morning, are you in Jesus Christ? I'm not asking about all the religious stuff. I'm not asking about how if your good outweighs your bad. I'm asking you, is Jesus Christ your Savior? Have you called on Him in faith? Confess that you were a sinner and ask Him to be your Savior and the Lord of your life. Listen, if you haven't, that's your first step. But if you're in Jesus, stand fast. Hold on. Because we are more than conquerors for Him that loved us. Let's stand together.